Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning. I, I know some of you are going to be disappointed because you were expecting someone with a southern accent, and I apologize. <laughs> uh, I, I have worked hard at trying to get this South Boston accent out, but I just can't do it, so I apologize for that. Uh, I thought it interesting a minute ago that Dr. O'Connor had the steering committee stand up so you could see who all was responsible for those who were speaking. So if this doesn't go well this morning, then you know who to blame. Uh, you, you got them. You know, we live in a world of divides, unfortunately, today. It, it's the political divide. It's the racial divide. It's the digital divide. It's the opportunity divide. And today we talk about the rural-urban divide. We call it disparities, but actually it's a divide. And I want to commend you for taking a proactive stand or step to try to bring those divides or disparities closer together because I think it's very important where we find ourselves today. This is what I want to cover this morning. I'll show you right off the bat those things that I think uh, need to be touched upon, but all of them come from the basis of my story. All of us have a story. We're affected by that story. What we do, what we think, how we react is guided by that story. And so my mine is different from some, similar to others, but nonetheless still has an impact for me when it comes to my story. I grew up in a large metropolitan town, population 42, <laughs> called Takawa. My mom and my dad did not graduate from high school. My mom dropped out of school in 10th grade, got married, which is what a lot of people did. My dad made it to the 8th grade. I realized as I got older that just because my mom dropped out of school in eighth grade did not mean she was dumb. Her favorite author was William Faulkner. And the older I've gotten, and on top of the 19 years of education that I've had, I find out that he's harder and harder to read and to understand. And the fact that my mom had read everything he had written, knew it, understood it, and loved it, made me have a greater appreciation for her once I developed some gray hair. So, and then my dad was a World War II veteran. He worked for the highway department. My mom was a seamstress. And for those of you who are not from the South and who do not believe that it snows in the South, I can assure you it used to. Because in the winter of 1963, actually 62, the day before Christmas, it snowed 15 inches. Now, I have since gone back with Google and everything, I have gone back to check it to make sure that my memory just wasn't foggy from my youth. They say it's 14 and a half inches, but it was really 15, I can assure you. <laughs> so, so I remember playing in the snow the entire Christmas holidays. Got sick, got pneumonia. Ended up spending two to three weeks in the local hospital. It was actually a clinic, but it was the local hospital. And my first grade teacher came every Thursday and spent from 3 o'clock to 6 o'clock going over everything I had missed. In today's world, I'd probably have to repeat the first grade. But she made sure I kept up. The one thing that was different then than you find today, there was no TV in the room. So all I had time to do was read. And I'll never forget the first grade teacher telling my mom, if you don't slow down, he's going to get ahead of the class. Now, can you imagine in today's world us telling a child to do that and to slow down and to not progress at whatever rate you could? But I believe that that was a significant thing that happened for me because I started reading my mom's books. And my mom's books were much more uh, advanced than a first, second, or third grade level. The next year, almost the identical thing happened, but it wasn't me. We got about a 13-inch snow right before Christmas in 1963. My father worked on the Department of Transportation. 
Now, you can imagine how ill-equipped a state like Mississippi was to get out and clean the roads with snow and ice and everything else. Nonetheless, they were out every day. He developed pneumonia, but he had no health care. No health care was provided. And if you missed a day's work, you missed pay. And so my dad never stopped working. I'll never forget Mr. Philip Darby walking in that morning in January and picking him up out of the bed because he could not get out of the bed. And that morning, at 42 years old, he died of pneumonia. Today, a very easily treated situation. But left my mom to raise the rest of us. And I can assure you it was not an easy undertaking. But nonetheless, that's how we grew up. Now, my dad had always talked about wanting a lawyer in the family. I have no earthly idea how a person who only went to the eighth grade and who had never been around lawyers wanted a lawyer. Uh, I have since found out that I think the only legal work he ever had done was he had the deed prepared to our home and he paid a lawyer five dollars and he thought that was highway robbery uh, and he wanted a lawyer in the family so he, he would not have to pay those high legal fees. So I, I accommodated him and if he knew my legal hourly rate right now he would roll over in his grave. I, I'm assure, I can assure you that. But, but so I went on to do that. I went and went to Northwest went to Ole Miss, graduated from Ole Miss, was the first person in my family to have ever graduated. Still the only one of my siblings and all to have graduated from college. I applied to law school, was accepted into law school, and then what happened was I was very nervous, I was very apprehensive. The truth of the matter is the first day of class I was scared to death. I, I did not know what to expect. So I walked into class 30 minutes early. I know none of you have ever done that. But I guess I was just going to get mentally prepared for what was, uh, I was going to face. There were three other guys already sitting in the class. I have no idea what their deal was. But I spoke to the two sitting on the row and sat down beside the guy next to me and struck up a conversation with him. And within five minutes, I came to two distinct conclusions. Number one, I wasn't that impressed with him. Number two, I got to thinking, if they've accepted him, <laughs> then I poked my chest out, and I felt much better about my chances. <laughs> now, in, in full disclosure, I will tell you that later on, he told that same story in front of 5,000 people in reverse. <laughs> he wasn't that impressed with me that morning either. As it turned out, that was John Grisham that I sat down. <laughs> so before you laugh at me and carry on about my inability to ascertain talent when it's up close and personal <laughs> to me, all I can do is plead, I, I couldn't figure it out. But I often say to first grade teachers, to kindergarten teachers, to pre-K teachers, who among us, when a little child walks into our classroom, can we tell who that person is, what that person's going to do, and the significance of that person in our lives and in our communities, in our state and in our country? And that is what has shaped my thinking the entire time. Now, my wife and I have four children. And unlike my brothers and sisters, there was never a time in any of our children's mind where they weren't going to go to college and weren't going to get, graduate from college. And all four of them have. I practice law with our oldest son. My young, our youngest daughter is a missionary. She graduated as a valedictorian of her class of 241 in high school went to Ole Miss and was Miss Ole Miss, and none of them ever thought about having a career without a college education. It's amazing what one generation can do as we look. 
And so that is why it's significant. My wife, I will tell you about her and then move on. My wife is a smart person in our family. She is Dr. Musgrove. And I call her that periodically just to let her know that I show my respect to her. She's a PhD. She was tapped by President Obama to be the director of all special education in the country and the only person in Mississippi to have ever uh, done that. And so we lived up here for about six years back and forth and all, and she is a professor now at Ole Miss, but with a background of understanding and knowing special education. So that's my story and my background, and that's what influences me when I look at certain things about the health disparities, the rural areas of our country, and what we could do or should do about those. If you look at the cost of chronic illness, if you haven't looked at this before, it's a little scary. 90% of all of our health care spend is on chronic illness. 70% of the deaths in the country are from chronic illness. 60% of Americans have chronic illnesses, and 40% of that group has two or more. And out of the $3.3 trillion spend on health care, three trillion of it is on chronic illness, which is an amazing figure. Now, what are the disparities between urban and rural when it comes to chronic illness? Top causes of death, heart disease, cancer, chronic lower respiratory disease, and diabetes, the top four. How do those two or those four look in comparison to urban and rural? As you all know, being in the profession you are, statistics are hard to come by, so the most recent ones we have are 2014. Heart disease. We have more than 25 excess deaths. I remember the first time I saw that term, excess death, and I said, what is that? How do you even define excess death? You know, we make the predictions all over the country in various areas about how many deaths we will have from a particular matter or thing. Excess deaths are the additional ones over our projection. So we projected X number of deaths of heart disease and there were 25,000 more than what was predicted. The difference between urban and rural in an approximation is 50% higher in the rural areas. Cancer, more than 19,000 excess deaths. Cancer is one of those situations where the overall cancer rates have declined with our treatment and all, but I, I, I wonder where we are in terms of cancer. Three years ago, my wife was diagnosed with breast cancer. And when she went and, and the diagnosis was made, she had a triple negative, which from what I understand is bad. And so in trying to develop the treatment and what she should do, she developed uh, a course of action. Uh, she ended up having treatment, had a lumpectomy, and then had chemotherapy and then radiation. Today, all of her margins are excellent. The doctor said, you have about a 10% chance of this coming back. And I looked at the doctor and I said, are you saying that there's a 90% chance that it won't come back? And she said, yes. And I said, I like those odds. I've never had 90% on anything in my life. And so she's doing great. But I remember each chemotherapy treatment we went to. There were over 40 rooms of people being treated for chemotherapy. And I remember looking at our insurance cost for each one of those treatments. And when I was sitting down talking to the University of Texas uh, uh, New School of Medicine in Austin, I remember telling them something. I said, you're probably not going to want to hear this, but I think I have a cure for cancer. Just, I was being flippant. 
I was being generic. And they looked at me and said, what? And I said, the best thing our government could do would be to put $1 trillion on the table. I didn't say billion. I said trillion. And the first person, group, entity that comes up with a cure, you get the trillion dollars. Because you've got to account for the lost profits in the treatment. Because it is so significant. It's so huge. And I said, I know you don't want to hear that. But I said, we've got to think in terms of what will matter in terms of policy. So that's one of the things you might take an issue with me about. One, unintentional injuries. Look at each one of those and you see the difference and the rates of how much higher it is in rural areas versus urban and certainly the chronic lower respiratory disease. All of those are significant and all of them between 40 and 50 percent higher in rural areas. You might ask the question, why? Well, if you look at rural demographics, and I think about the people that I grew up with and that I know, these are the very things that you're fighting to try to educate people on and try to get them to do better in their lives. Higher percentage of people smoke. Hypertension and obesity in rural areas. You know, my wife and I lived up here for, for the six years, and I'll never forget, we had a car here. But our first mode of transportation was walking. Second was bicycle, third was metro, and about the fifth was a car. Where I live in the country, you don't get anywhere without getting in the car. Just the way it is. And that is unfortunate, but that, that's rural areas. It's older, poorer, sicker, lower rates of physical activity and seatbelt usage, and then less health insurance and trauma centers that, that you deal with. Those are issues that face every rural area in America. Then the social determinants of, of health. I, I have come to believe more and more that these are more important than almost anything else. The more educated we are, the better we take care of ourselves. The more educated we are, the more we know to go and do something or to find a remedy. And, and so people who do not have education opportunity, people who do not have economic opportunity, are almost sentenced to a continual plight of social determinants that are less than those who are educated. And that's why I felt like it was so important to try to convert, in a state like Mississippi, our policy to reflect what would help in our basically rural states. I'll give you three quick examples. Dr. O'Connor gave you one. I could not imagine why we would have the CHIP program in place for over 15 months and have less than 1,000 children on it. We revamped it, looked at it, retargeted it, and got to over 60,000 in one year. But I felt like that was really, really important. We rewrote the school funding formula so that children in rural poverty areas who did not have a high tax, ad valorem tax base, would get additional money so that those schools could offer same or at least similar coursework to the schools that were in the higher ad valorem tax area. That was a game changer. And then third, we were, under my administration, we changed the Economic Development Act, and we actually brought Nissan to our state. Uh, Nissan has accounted for over 30,000 jobs, direct and indirect, in Mississippi, which, again, is a game changer. I remember doing two things in negotiating that with the CEO of Nissan. I said, number one, when you build we want you to have at least 20% of the contractors to be minority contractors. Because you cannot bid on a job unless on your resume you say you have done similar work. And so consequently, it ended up being 24%. The other thing I said is, 
how many people do you need to lead Nissan that you have to bring in from the outside? And he said about 3%. And I said, well, then I want to put in the MOU that at least 97% of your workforce will be Mississippians. And they did. And we have 82 counties, and we have people employed from all 82 counties in Mississippi at that Nissan plant in central Mississippi. Those were policies that I felt like helped move the needle in the right direction when you talk about social determinants. And to me, those are significant, and those are the kinds we cannot turn our back on when we're looking at what will matter and make a difference in people's lives. And those are there, and you can, you can see each one of those that, to me, the economic stability and the educational opportunity produce the greatest part. I always flip them. I always say education first, then economic opportunity second. 15% of Americans live in rural areas, and only 25% of those people actually do those things that we call better statistics or better practices in terms of good health. Not smoking, maintaining normal body weight. Uh, I, I, I guess some of you guys spoke. I, I'm not sure how being in the medical profession you could ever smoke, uh, knowing all of the downsides uh, to that. I'll let you know just out of, a, again, a sense of honesty. I quit in the second grade. I just could not do it anymore <laughs> after that. I smoked heavily to the second grade and then quit. <laughs> but, but, but maintaining normal body weight, being active, non-drinking or moderately drinking, we're not even going to talk about not drinking, but at least, at least moderately drinking, uh, and sufficient sleep. Only 25% of people in the rural area do at least four out of five of those things. That's another reason that you have the disparities that we do. The mortality rate. Look at the four areas or groups of people and the mortality rate is the same or, or similar. In the African American community, much higher in rural than in urban. The American uh, Indian, Alaska Native, it's the greatest disparity, rural versus urban. White community, same way. And then Asian or Pacific Islander, likewise. Those are statistics you cannot just turn your back to and say do not exist. And so again, when we're looking at policy, when we look at advocacy, when we look at things that matter, I think bringing that divide in makes a lot of difference. I, I can't talk about health care and other things without specifically focusing on the Southeast. That, that's where I'm from but that's also one of the most troubling areas, statistically. If you look at heart disease or look at the stroke rates in the country, you see it is disproportionately larger in the Southeast. That's, I don't have the slides for it, but I would venture to say that that's true for almost every area in terms of these chronic diseases that we're talking about. And yet, when you go to the next slide, if you look at where the financially distressed hospitals are, and when you look at the states who have not expanded Medicaid, you see the mirror of those two. Right now, we have 17 states that have not ex expanded Medicaid. We have three that are considering it. The rest of them have. Don't want to get into a political matter, but if you look at the states who have not, and you look at the financially distressed hospitals, and you lay that over each other as this slide does, you do not have to be a rocket scientist to figure out where they are. There are a few exceptions to that. When we talk about rural health, sometimes we all think it's just one single thing. However, rural health in Mississippi looks a lot different from rural health in Montana or Iowa, which is actually talking about frontier health. Third-party payers in Montana, Wyoming, and other areas are much higher than a place like Mississippi, Alabama, others. So, so you're talking about a much more dense population 
and a much higher percentage of people on Medicaid in the Southeast. And when you look at that, that is a troubling statistic for looking at the disparity problems and the future disparity problems. The one thing I might say for those of you who are familiar with the disproportionate share, et cetera, that, that has always been in place for hospitals in rural areas that did not have volume or high payers, under the Affordable Care Act, of course, that's going to be diminished. And so the idea was that by expanding Medicaid, you would make up the difference between the loss of that disproportionate share amount and what the Affordable Care Act would give you. So for a state that doesn't expand Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act, you are losing your disproportionate share amount and you're foregoing the increased amount for the coverage of the additional people. Once again, I'm not a rocket scientist, but I can figure out that math. And that is a very, very disturbing statistic. And then for those of you, I uh, had a chance to talk to a number of you, again, from the Southeast. This just shows what I was just talking about earlier. And that is that the greatest number of closures on rural hospitals are in that broad area of the Southeast. Now, you see that they're actually all over the country, but in greater numbers in the Southeast. And so I, I'm not here to tell you that your focus should only be on the Southeast. Your focus needs to be everywhere. But I hope as you work through that, you recognize that a greater proportion of the disparity happens in the Southeast. And some of it is by virtue of our own fault. Okay, I acknowledge that. But there are still those of us, and I appreciate those of you, who are continuing to advocate for policies that make sense to stop and to reduce the disparities. I want to thank you very much for allowing me to be here and talking to you this morning, and I understand that... I understand, make sure that we do have plenty of time, Bill. As, as Bill is coming up, uh, I want to tell you, I had the chance to uh, get together, and I still get together with about five of my first grade classmates, six or eight times a year. My wife says, I can't even name you one person in my first grade class. But we still get together. And they are all much more conservative than I am. I appreciate them, I like them, I respect them, but clearly I'm on the progressive scale a little bit more. And we get together, and when we had our house on Capitol Hill, I told a couple of them, three of them, I said, why don't you just come up here and spend a long weekend, and let's take you around D.C. and do all of that. And they did, and we walked on the mall. I am telling you what, by mid-morning, I've never seen people breathing so hard, so out of shape. And they looked at me and said, can't we get a cab? Now, these are all college-educated, in some instances, multiple college degrees. And they were worn out by mid-morning. And some of us, or maybe all of us, are in that situation. So I encourage all of us, me included, to do a better job and be a better example uh, for better health and activity. Bill, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Governor Musgrove, and appreciate uh, your comments. Let's give him another round of applause. I think that was fantastic.